Good afternoon, members of parliament, support staff, visitors, well, not no visitors in the tribune as yet, radio listeners, TV viewers, those following via social media, and members of the media. Welcome to the continuation of this urgent public meeting number 19 of today, Wednesday, August 17, 2022. I would like to welcome the Minister of Public Housing, Spatial Planning, Environment and Infrastructure, Mr. Egbert Duran and his support staff. And we have established a quorum of nine members. Please let's stand for a moment of silence. I've received notice of absence from Member of Parliament MP Akim Arundel, MP Sihat Bijlani, and MP William Marlin. Is there any Member of Parliament who would like to have the floor for notifications? I see no need. Then we go straight to the agenda point. We have as agenda point today the final report of the Ombudsman regarding the tendering and the awarding process of the garbage collection contract 2021 to 2026. This can be found under IS 1103, parliamentary year 2021 to 2022, dated June 28, 2022. We go over to the agenda point. On June 28, 2022, Parliament received a letter from members of Parliament MP Melissa Gums, MP Christophe Emmanuel, MP Sarah Westcott Williams, and MP Rayon Peterson, with the request that an urgent public meeting of Parliament be convened to address the final report of the Ombudsman regarding the tendering and awarding process of the garbage collection 2021 to 2026. The report of the Ombudsman on the systemic investigation is registered again under IS 1098. Parliamentary year 2021 to 2022, dated June 27, 2022. The presence of the Minister of Public Housing, Spatial Planning, Environment, and Infrastructure was desired but not required for this meeting. This meeting was, was called and took place on June 29, 2022, in the presence of the Minister of Romi. The Minister of Romi was then given the opportunity to give some opening remarks and presentation and the members of parliament was given the opportunity to pose questions to the minister in the first round. The meeting was then adjourned and allowed the minister time to prepare the answers for the questions. And today, the minister of Rami, Mr. Egbert Duran, have returned to parliament to provide the answers to the questions posed by members of parliament in the first round, hence today's meeting. At this time, I'd like to give the floor to the minister of Rami, Minister Egbert Duran, for his opening remarks, and I see that he has a presentation and to provide answers to the questions posed by members of parliament. Minister, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Lady. Good afternoon, honorable members of parliament, my support staff, support staff of the parliament, and a special good afternoon to the people of St. Martin. Madam Chair Lady, I'm here on the floor of parliament today to provide answers to the question posed. But before doing so, I find it most prudent to introduce to the topic covered in my answers, ensure a thorough response per question as possible, so your indulgence is therefore requested. The questions I've been posed pertain to a preliminary, preliminary uh, solid waste tender, in terms of reference to the processes carried out during said tour, and to the findings of the Ombudsman in the systemic investigation. For the answers, to provide clarification being sought from Parliament, an overview of these key elements on the topic of the Ombudsman report will now be provided. In regards to previous tenders, historically there have been several tenders for among which solid waste collection tender. Those awarded the garbage contracts after formalities have been dealt with will receive a landscape slide co-signed and vetted by the Governor. The tender awardees are granted a period of five years for the bids that are won. The companies would have then paid, would have to be then paid, and that's why the budget plays such an important role. By the start of each awarded contract, both the government and the winners of the bid are aware of the start and also the end date. <clears throat> Unfortunately, early 2020, our country as well as the world was struck with COVID-19 pandemic. Not only was our island shut down, 
from the outside world, but our ministry suffered as well. Illnesses of staff and members, illnesses of their families, deaths, persons becoming ill, reinfected with the coronavirus, caused a considerable burden on the strain of the already undermanned ministry. The cabinet continuously requested a timeline as to when the tour would be ready, especially given the fact that it was approximately six months away from the expiring date of the contracts of the time, at the time. It was brought forward in a discussion with the infrastructure management department that the staff had little experience creating a terms of reference and that the former department head executed most of the actions in regard to preparing the finalization documents for terms of references. The cabinet repeatedly requested updates and the response was mostly geared towards granting an extension to those that already had the contract at the time. During these discussions, documentations that were drafted in the past for the tender process that was requested was requested. However, we were informed that the documentation of the past were lost in the form of Rummy Building and Yellow Building. Suddenly, on October 21st, 2020, I then received an email from the acting department head informing me that she was resigning as of November 1st, 2020. <clears throat> A new department head was then appointed as of November 1st, 2020. Another inquiry was made with the department requesting a timeline on the final terms of reference. However, there were no concrete responses on when this would be realized. And another request was sent to the Department of Infrastructure Management on January 8, 2021 by the cabinet to again provide documentation regarding the previous tender executed in regard to the solid waste. On, June, on January 12, 2021, an email response was received from the section head, again reiterating that most documents requested were lost in the former building due to the passing of Hurricane Irma. <clears throat> However, on January 18, 2021, another email was sent to the cabinet by the section head that the documentation was found. However, she forgot to communicate this before. It was also made abundantly clear that there would be no extensions granted by my person. <clears throat> I was not about to entertain violating of the compatibilities for ordering without proper motivation. The staff was urged to ensure that the tour was drafted and vetted by the relevant stakeholders. The section head contract management then indicated at the time to, that the time was too close and they were short staff. I then offered that I would ask my colleague Minister of TIAT and Finance to assist Romy in providing staff to finalize the, the, the tours before the expiration date. Immediately I got a response that was that, that won't be necessary. <clears throat> it was at the time when it was that time when the department head and section head of infrastructure management requested the assistance of cabinet members to meet the deadline. This was confirmed via memo sent to my person on March 29, 2021. Allow me to read the memo. Dear Minister Durant, I have taken note of your email addressed to me on March 19th. You mentioned in your letter that it is evident that there has been a confidentiality breach and information within the ministry it has been disclosed to third parties. In my opinion, this statement has no factual basis because this was never proven. Indeed, there isn't a policy highlighting the processes that should be outlining the procedures carrying public tenders evaluations that are used by the Department of Infrastructure Management, which has my full attention. And I will discuss this further with the policy department. <coughs> In my memo to you dated March 7th, I made mention that the processes followed from A to Z were followed from A to Z because those were the process of the department always worked by. Regarding the alleged conflict of interest, it was never brought to my attention, nor was I aware of this. Had that been the case, then I would have reported it to you immediately, remove the person from the committee, and remove the person from the committee. In the meantime, I asked the staff if any one of their family members partook in the bidding process, and they all answered no. I have a lot large, I have not, not large a complaint nor objection on how things were done because there was no need to do so. Moreover, I was surprised when the staff informed me that they took distance from the process and mentioned that they sought legal counsel once I requested them to put their concerns in writing. Noteworthy to make mention is that the entire experience was new for me after taking up the position and recognizing that the time was of the essence. I decided to discuss the possibility of you making staff members available to assist me in 2021-2026 solid waste tender, to which I'm grateful that you made it possible. Moreover, in my opinion, the entire process and situation could have been avoided had the preliminary work been done, started back in the beginning of 2020, which did not take place. 
In closing, our hard work and determination prevail with reflects and which reflects in the advice that was approved. I hope to have informed you accordingly. <coughs> It is therefore important to note that it was not I, as the Minister of Rumi, attempting to insert my cabinet in committees evaluating the tour, but the relevant department head and section head who requested my cabinet's assistance, which I complied with, to ensure the work was executed. I can assume that not working with colleagues and staff that you are accustomed to, in combination with time constraints, was not easy. Requests and most probably caused discussions on differences of opinion. Working during a pandemic is not ideal and having to do so under time constraints while short staff presented a challenge to the ministry and this, and this country. This country has never, a pandemic that this country has never experienced before. The staff of the ministry and the cabinet should be commended for their diligent work during this time and I would like to take this opportunity to once more thank all that was involved and continue to produce despite the challenges. I'll delve into now the terms of reference before delving into the terms of reference, I would like to remind the Honorable Members of Parliament that St. Martin, unlike the Netherlands, does not have a tender legislation in place. St. Martin has been having bids awarding contracts for government works for many decades already without tender legislation in place. How and who were awarded the contracts for government bids and tenders that will have left much to be desired in the sense of transparency based on feedback that I have been receiving. At the time of the garbage tender, I was in office for seven months in an attempt to provide the public with an idea as to how the Ministry of Rummy envisions a public tender procedure being dealt with. An internal established guideline was prepared and published in December of 2021. Here too, I would like to commend the staff for the cabinet and the staff of the ministry for their efforts. Prior to the document being published by the ministry in 2021, to my knowledge at least, there have been no other document made available for the people of St. Martin to gain insight behind the scenes of what happens with public tenders and thereby provide clear desire for transparency. The ministry received feedback on the document in this regard as well. The document published is achieving the desired goal to initiate and promote public dialogue on how government can provide transparency in a working government and improve our government processes until your Honorable Members of Parliament can vote and implement a public tender law that is desperately needed for our island. With no legal framework available for the solid waste collection tender written in our laws, the term of reference was drafted. Important to note, in regards to the terms of reference, the tour provides an upfront presentation of potential bidders as to the framework with, in which bids can be made and contracts can be awarded. It is then up to the bidder to submit or not. <clears throat> government can then use the following years after the awarding and evaluating of the tour to have a fruitful dialogue about how and where tours can be adjusted in the future for public tenders. A tour, therefore, is not a document written in stone, a permanent document, but can be changed and reevaluated to ensure the best outcome for both parties and bidders, bidders and government in general. A recent solid waste collection public tender was created using among others, the SAB, the FIDIC, and the FIDIC Green Book. The SAB is a document made up by the Department of Public Works in Curso and the Department of Finance Section Internal Experts. The FIDIC Green Book was also used as a document to prepare a set tour. The tour of 2021 can and will be used to prepare the tour for 2026, but is not bound by any and every part of the tour of 2021. This is why feedback of the Ombudsman via her systemic investigation report is crucial in the last tour and will continue to be relevant for future tours. The purpose of both the tour and government is to continue to seek out areas that we can use to improve, implement in our terms of reference in our processes. To be clear, as it pertains to any persons and or companies awarded contracts, the contract signs provide remedies to enforce and or address any shortcomings of the contractors, as is in the case with most contracts. Should, be the, relevant, should the relevant company not adhere to the contract, Country St. Martin has built in safeguards and or sanctions for said company. This means that even after the awarding contract, the vigilance of the ministry remains a focal point for the project managers within the ministry, the contract managers within the ministry. It's not like the person is granted a contract 
and have carte blanche for five years period and government is stuck and could not work out with the contractor. This is why the tour, this is the way the tour contracts the tender procedures from a sort of synergy for continuity, improving works being offered by gov to government and works being provided. An information session was held after the tour went out and questions were asked and answers were given to this in said session where minutes were attached to the appendix. As such, those questions and answers became part of the terms of reference. The Solid Ways Collection Awarding Advice was drafted and concluded with the combined efforts and feedback from the following departments and persons, namely the contract management staff, the contract management section head, then to the department head of infrastructure management and sent to the financial controller. The secretary general and staff move on and then it moves on to the Ministry of Finance where FBB and FA then on to the Minister of Vromi. The advice and supporting documents are then sent to the Council of Ministers for their approval. Prior to the approval, it also goes through a Basilis Reipheit Stutz. Then on to the Minister of Finance. The documents are finally sent to the Governor for approval and returned to the Ministry for, awarding, for the awarding process, where the LBA that is signed by the Governor is also signed by the Minister of Vromi. To my knowledge and recollection, there were no complaints received about the tour prior to the awarding of the contract to bidders who won. After the public tender concluded and the awarding took place, according to the department head of the ministry, received two complaints and two inquiries. Two complaints of a total of 26 bidders who placed a bid. The ministry considered this an indication that the tendering process was successful. So a clear total of 93% who participated did not object, file complaints, nor make queries. Two persons filed a complaint at the ministry who also filed a complaint at the ombudsman. The ombudsman mediated those complaints based on the answers provided. The ombudsman then concluded that those complaints were then closed. It was here after that the ombudsman started her own systemic investigation based on the ordinance for the ombudsman. It is important to note that in this regard, that when the Ombudsman started a systemic investigation, there were no pending complaints on the solid waste tender. The Ombudsman presents, represents the, indiv uh, the individual. If said individual has a complaint against government, the Ombudsman can investigate the complaint or initiate their own systemic investigation. The Ombudsman who answers to Parliament is expected to be thorough and aware of the circumstances at play as, po as possible when conducting investigation. It with this in mind, the ministry hoped that the ombudsman was aware that obviously those that who were not awarded the contracts for garbage collection would be understandably upset. The ministry feels it important to note that not being satisfied with the outcome of a public tender does not automatically equate to inappropriate actions or inactions by government. To re reiterate, the ministry has already published internal guidelines as the public tender prior to the conclusion of the ombudsman report as such as already before the conclusion was drawn by the Ombudsman, made efforts to increase transparency and communication to the general public. To be clear, the Ministry has provided the support and respect to the Ombudsman Office before, during, and after the systemic investigation. For example, the Ministry provided the Ombudsman with repeated offers to come to the government building and go through any documents needed. We also requested to go to the Ombudsman Office to further elaborate on documentation, to receive or give explanations and or feedback. As to the process and her queries, the ministry provided the ombudsman with internal correspondences to highlight where there was possibility that some hostility being experienced among the staff was due to personal conflicts of interest and or concerns. The current contract holders would be advantaged by the extension if those contracts were to have been extended. Madam Chair, I would like to ask for three minutes before I go into the answering of the you question. You would like to have a three minute break? Yes, sure. Meeting adjourned for three minutes. Let me structure it.
Welcome back, members of parliament. We just took a brief adjournment for the minister to gather some his documents, and I would like to turn the floor immediately over to the minister for his answering of questions. I think we're going to be doing right now, right, minister? Answering, yes, correct. There you go. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll start with questions posed by MP Emanuel. Are you saying that the findings in the Ombudsman report are untrue? As expressed before, I believe that the report is incomplete and or unbalanced. The Ombudsman was provided with a multitude of additional documentation that did not find its way into the report. If the Ombudsman was of the opinion that information provided was not relevant, I could have understood and have approached that report made mention, approach it in that, appreciate it in that report that would have mentioned that the information was not needed. Of said documentation, but mentioned the reasons why said documentation was not included as well. For example, the Ombudsman was provided with, among others, a communication from the then Department Head of Infrastructure Management indicating that only he had the key to the room where the bid boxes were being kept. Yet the report mentions that a box mysteriously reappearing without highlighting how and when the box was allegedly disappeared. Based on Article 16, Lit 14 and 5 of the Lansford Auditing Ombudsman, the law stipulates that the Ombudsman should have refrained from bringing out an opinion on solid waste collection public tender if the Ombudsman was unsure or unclear on the certain aspects of their findings instead of using words like apparently without indicating where the apparent nature to the remarks online in the synopsis, please find the following remarks, which is shared by the majority of those you heard and are interviewed. Seeing that several statements without the eval throughout the evaluation committee synopsis refers to further statements from other staff that took part in verification of your document documented statements, we sought clarity by the respective individuals. The sentiments that are written in the EC synopsis has not been brought forward to the acting SG, nor myself. Even after several correspondences with the then acting head, the correspondences were also sent to your office as I made reference to them during my hearing. The undersigned agrees that it was imperative to respond to the remarks throughout the various synopsis as well as pointing out some of the observations in general. With the synopsis of the evaluation committee, it states on page nine, a EC member indicated having experience doing price calculations before in district cleaning, trench, and waterways in the past. This statement must be zoomed into as the services of the management of the plant is ending on December 31st and this project tender due date is passed. Currently, the management of the wastewater treatment plant on Ailage Road is being outsourced to a third party which came out by means of a public tender. In order for a public tender to take place again, an internal government price needs to be determined prior to tendering. The ministry has not been able to move forward with the retendering of the management of the wastewater treatment plant because a price calculation could not be done by the personnel within the section of contract management. I also sent an attachment correspondence which was also sent to the House of Parliament. In the attached correspondence, it's evident that the team has expressed that they are incapable of doing such calculations as they do not have sufficient knowledge or expertise of the tasks at hand within the section. Due to the above described challenges, the ministry is forced to find new means of having service continued by extension procedure. Not having the continuation of the management of the wastewater plant would have been, would have been extremely a detrimental impact on the island. Needless to say, the above mentioned statement in the synopsis report not only contains inconsistencies of statements made by individuals, but also shows deliberate, deliberate negligence of staff where their responsibilities are concerned. In addition to the above, it's noted that the methodology and details of the calculations of the government price should remain confidential. The general public should not be made aware of any means of compositions or computations related to the cost estimate of government projects. Another observation with the synopsis report of the evaluation committee members, statements were made regarding the security of documents, that they were no longer guaranteed and a key that was returned, as well as an unusual activity of the cabinet member requesting a key to enter a room where the documents were stored. Based on your statements in the report, a meeting was convened to seek clarity on this observation, where the department head confirmed that this has not been the case where the security safety of the documents was concerned. He confirmed that none of the cabinet members requested a key 
and even up to this moment, while holding another position as a senior official within the department, he remains in possession of said key where the documents are stored. False statements of this kind from individuals create controversial scenarios which brings the integrity of the ministry in question. On the subsection score sheet within the synopsis, mention is made of a result of a contractor winning almost all parcels with the first formula, and as a result, the acting SG and the minister decided to use another formula for pricing. The correct explanation is as follows. The formula was never changed. The manner in which the formula was interpreted and information inserted by a staff member was erroneous. This was explained to him by the acting SG in the presence of my person. The staff member then became emotionally upset as a result of the explanation and correction from the acting SG and the staff member proceeded to firmly slam his hand on the office desk and shouted, making it clear he does not agree with the SG. Another example of an emotional outburst was when the preliminary winner of Parcel 1 was made known within the team, namely Meadowlands. A staff member, another staff member, had a strong disagreement by expressing her choice of words. This is BS, excuse me, but this was the words. This outburst with obscene language was observed by my person, the acting SG, the department head, the section head of contract management, as well as a cabinet member. After the outburst, she continued to question those present, you know how hard they worked? Referring to the contractor quality sweepers, who should have won based on her opinion. This type of behavior and outburst, in my opinion, is out of place, and I also made my position clear with the then acting department head. Under the subsection parts, points for allocation for pricing, mention is made of changes to the formula used, that the formula changed to the compliance formula, and that this was decided by top management. The compliancy range was determined and arranged upon prior to the bidding and was never changed. Neither was the formula stated above. As mentioned previously, the way the calculations was inserted was wrongfully done by the department staff. Moreover, it states that the minister was not happy with the results and also instructions were given to the committee members requested the process to be retendered, which was denied. These statements are not factual and are opinion-based. This was no request. There was never a request to retender. Therefore, I was never able to deny such. In closing, the persons being interviewed, as far as the ministry could ascertain, were promised that they would receive their individual minutes for review for feedback. The choice made make a synopsis of the EC members meeting, held an individual meeting, and only certain persons caught, caused much confusion amongst the staff in terms of responding to your office. Several further details have been provided to the Office of the Ombudsman, which I look forward to it being included in the final report to reflect what factually took place. The ministry looks forward to your draft report before the report is concluded, much like what took place in the phase when the individual synopsis hearings in questions. I look forward to the outcome of the recommendations as they can be applied to increase the effectiveness, thoroughness throughout the process of the ministry moving forward. Signed by my person, the acting SG, and the acting department head. Next question by MP Manuel. Are you calling the Ombudsman a liar? This is false. I have never called the Ombudsman a liar. The Ombudsman has concluded that the tender was neither transparent nor fair without substantiating this conclusion with, with proven facts. It is based on the facts and circumstances as described in the introduction and the previous answer that the Ministry does not share the opinion of the Ombudsman. As opinions are healthy for debate regarding opinions are integral part of our democratic society. I believe the question posed by the Honorable Member of Parliament perhaps mistakes agreeing to disagreeing, synonymous with making someone out to be a liar, especially to the floor of Parliament. I must assume that the Honorable Member of Parliament appreciates that 15 members of Parliament will not share the same views on any given topic. That does not mean that members of Parliament not agreeing 100% on a topic are liars or vice versa. Our beautiful political system allows the debate between all representatives of the people of St. Martin without meaning that one of the honorable members of parliament opinion shows more value or worth than another. Some of us are music enthusiasts. Allow me to elaborate on my previous point by referencing music errors. 
there are those who strongly believe that the 70s had the best music. However, there are those who would disagree and standpoint and claim that the 80s had the best music. It does not mean that those not agreeing in opinions are calling others out to be liars. So it's my hope that the continued efforts between the ministry and the ombudsman will make the government more effective, more e a more effective institution to better serve the people. I'm therefore, <clears throat> I am for the people, and I continue to strive to make an improvement in processes I inherited as stated in my introduction. I would like to hereby reiterate that the ministry appreciates the recommendations as outlined in the report, and we continue to strive towards improvement. Next question by the same MP. What are the reasons that four persons left the evaluation committee? Four persons, four evaluation members did not resign from the committee. One member resigned and two members distanced themselves after the evaluation phase, claiming that the tender did not go in accordance to department procedure. When asked by the department head as to what the reasons were for the, for the distancing, persons who possibly had to distance themselves from the committee, they chose not to answer the moment, however stated that they would seek legal advice. However, in an email dated March 18th from the section head contract management, who was also part of the committee, stated the following. Dear department head, I receive your email in good order. Seeing that the Council of Ministers and the Governor Cabinet approved the Tor Solid Waste contract for 2021-2026, and all the contracts to the parcels have been awarded and signed with the works slated to start April 1st, I am of the opinion there is no need for me to expound any further on this matter. Next, as you assured me on various occasions during the evaluation process, that as our head of department, you are going to take full responsibility concerning the procedures leading to the outcome of the tender process. With that statement, I conclude that you as our head will be the one handling all issues concerning this. I'm not sure which issues were being referred to, but I guess it's this, these, these issues. Solid waste collection for 2021, 2026 moving forward. Meaning that any questions that might arise along the way, you will deal with. Seeing that you were well informed about all the hiccups encountered from the beginning up to the end of the evaluation. I thank you for taking your leadership seriously and backing up the support we're given during this time. Kind regard, section head. Madam Chair, members of parliament, my best estimation is that there were some amongst the committee members that were not pleased with the outcome and the persons that they have a particular affinity with did not meet the qualifications despite them having had contracts in previous tenders. And I caution the ombudsman to be vigilant for a possible agitation amongst committee members. Next question posed by MP Manuel. Where did the replacements come from? Four evaluation members did not resign from the committee. One member resigned and two members distanced themselves from the evaluation committee, claiming that the tender did not go to procedure, as I mentioned just now. The same members that so-called distanced themselves continue with the finalization of the advice and all necessary documentation. Therefore, there was no need to replace any members. Why were the cabinet members part of the evaluation committee? As I mentioned in the introduction, but I'll reiterate it here, the then department head of infrastructure management and section head of contract management requested the assistance of the cabinet to tackle the heavy workload in, a, in meeting deadlines as well as dealing with the shortage of staff. The then head of infra and section head contract management requested to have two senior staff members of my cabinet assist in handling the workload to meet the deadline. I did not honor the res this request as it, would have been, as it would have hampered my day-to-day -day operations within the cabinet. As the deadline was set and being worked on, I opted to offer one senior support staff and one senior advisor and one support staff to provide assistance where needed. Does the minister believe having a cabinet member of staff as the evaluation committee a conflict of interest? No. I'm of the opinion that this does not constitute a conflict of interest. Support was requested to achieve the target within the time constraints. There was therefore a clear distinction between the evaluating of the documents, advising on the documents, and deciding on the documents. There cannot be a situation of a conflict of interest. For the record, I did not instruct neither my cabinet or any committee member how and what they were evaluating based on, how and what to evaluate they were working based on the tour. Of course, I was kept abreast 
by the of the developments as I was ensuring the deadlines were being taken seriously by the department head. All persons directly involved with the evaluation of the bids used the tour as their guidance. This also provided me with the assurance that the right measuring stick is being used by the evaluation committee once evaluating said documents. Next question by MP Manuel. How many original committee members had experience with the tender process? The process with the tender originates from, with the tour. In the tour states, the documents are needed, how points are scored and allotted. That is therefore a question of reading and applying what is in the tour. All of the persons involved in the public procurement and bidding process can read and can apply what is being read. As the tour gave them a backdrop to the requirements, evaluating the documents, etc., it was more a question of going down the checklist in the tour and having an extensive tender experience, not, and not having extensive tender procedures experience per se. To answer your question specifically, all persons in one way or another had direct or indirect experiences with public bidding processes. How many evaluation committee members after the four left have, ex have experience in the tender process? I would like to refer you to the previous answer. I now move on to question posed by the Honorable Member of Parliament MP Bryson. Honorable Minister, would you agree that this tender process that in this tender process some things could have gone differently and be done better? MP, to you, Madam Chair, I can agree that some things could have gone better. In particular, the department should have worked on tendering the process in advance, which would alleviate the under heavy time constraints, also properly outlining the expectations within the royal group would have minimized any conflicts of opinion. This coincides with the Ombudsman's second recommendation, whereas points was given in regards to the implementation of critical deadlines. Would you agree that there's room for improvement? If you could go back, would there be some things that you would adjust differently? Of course, in everything we do in life, I believe there's always room for improvement. I would surely request the department to start tender, the tendering process for a contract of this magnitude at least one year in advance. <coughs> this will ensure proper planning could take place and also the proper, eventually proper execution. I would also have ensured that a policy was in place with procedures as well documented which the ministry has prepared in the meantime in order for all including external stakeholders and contractors to be aware of our processes. Another important improvement is to increase the number of staff within the department. The ministry has recently hired a contract manager. The hiring of a second contract manager is in the final stages. We are also currently, based on the job mixer, in the recruitment process of a third contract manager to add to the department. We are also looking into giving the department staff regular training so that they can better deal with their workload. Does the minister feel, next question by MP Bryson, does the minister feel that pointing out certain aspects of the report that he just simply cannot objectively, objectively agree to, does that mean that the minister is dismissing the ombudsman? Is he being disrespectful to the ombudsman or is he within his rights within the procedures laid out by law? To answer your question, MP, through you, Madam Chair, I don't believe that this is being disrespectful as the two institutions should be able to have open dialogue and agreement also when in disagreement. In my recent letter to the Ombudsman dated July 11, 2022, I thanked the Ombudsman for this same report and also with the, for the recommendations on the systemic in, during the systemic investigation. I also made mention in the same letter of the recommendations as outlined in the final report that are aligned with the vision of the Ministry because we are busy now improving our processes, which include improve, improving the department's expertise and the services. Next question by MP Bryson to you, Madam Chair. Does the minister feel that is indeed within his rights to highlight some of the things that he is not in agreement with, which can probably create dialogue, which can be seen in the report of the press statement and press statement? I believe in general all professionals should be able to allow, should be allowed to express their views and differences they may have on certain subjects that they are not in alignment with. It is the intention of the Ministry of Romney to further improve increased dialogue with the Ombudsman Office to, present, to prevent misunderstandings and misinterpretations moving forward. Two weeks ago, 
or three weeks ago, we recently had a meeting where we assigned a new liaison, new agreements were made, and we are working towards getting our responses together for ombudsman cases and cases in general. Next question posed by MP Bryson to you, Madam Chair. Did the governor have to be involved in this in any way? And what, can, what is his involvement? What is his role? What is his feedback? What is the feedback the minister received from the governor throughout the process? Upon approval of the advice by the Council of Ministers, it was submitted to the cabinet of the governor for approval. Minor adjustments and recommendations were made to the national decree by the cabinet of the governor, which was adapted as standard. Did the minister meet with the governor, his legal team, his staff? Did they evaluate the process as well? No. The advice in regard to solid waste collection 2021-2026 was submitted to the cabinet of the governor and followed the regular process. How was the tendering done within the Ministry of Rummy in the past and what was used? Who was the decision maker and what, who was the evaluation committee and who selected the evaluation committee? According to information I received from the Department of Infrastructure, the most things were handled by the department head and the department head would assign individuals. And I do not know for certain as there were no set written policies as to how this process went. When speaking to staff, they keep referencing unwritten procedures which was never provided to me during the tender process. Minister, can you explain what you met, the adjustments that were made, what adjustments are you going to take moving forward? Well, I must say that there hasn't been any documented procedures and processes within the ministry outlining tender procedures in general, besides the administrative guidelines such as the FIDIC and the SAB, as I mentioned earlier, for the managing of projects in the execution phase. The ministry has taken steps to introduce the policy for tender processes as there hasn't been any internal documentation on how these things are carried out in the past. Moving forward, it is my intention to continue improving the ministry and upgrading the staff, providing them with adequate tools and resources needed to carry out their functions. Next question posed by MP Bryson. Where did the Ombudsman extract this unwritten policy from? Was it in the meetings, the email, or minutes? The unwritten policy, I'm assuming, may have been communicated during the hearings of the staff from the ministry. In my opinion, public tenders and unwritten policies do not go hand in hand, which is why we took the initiative to document the procedures used within the ministry for public tenders while we wait the establishment of a national procurement policy. There have not been any documentation outlining procedures within the ministry in relation to tender before, take, before I took office, and we have solely relied on individuals to handle their tasks over the years. This current tender policy highlights several steps that will ensure public tenders are handled in a more transparent manner, including digit, a digital aspect of digital submissions of bids. Any transition into a digital, as we transition into a digital era, documenting these types of procedures not only ensure better handling for the ministry, but it also gives potential bidders clear insights into the steps taken so that they can be treated fairly. <clears throat> Next question posed by MP Bryson. How was the unwritten policy executed in the past and who executed the unwritten policy? To you, Madam Chair. The section contract management informed me that they could not provide me with any written procedures back in 2020, as I mentioned. However, an additional inquiry was made by the cabinet on July 27th of this year, 2022, and surprisingly, I was provided with a long list of so-called unwritten procedures on August 2nd, 2022. <clears throat> How did they know what to follow in the guidelines? Did the civil service, what guidelines did the civil servants go by? I'd mentioned earlier, there were no written internal procedures or processes for tender, whereas there was room created for a conflict of opinion, which according to me has been the case all along. As mentioned earlier, in my opinion, not having such documentation in place in terms of a guideline allows too much operational ambiguity as for no specific task or pro can be properly outlined when carrying out this process, which to me is not so safe and not transparent. How did the minister reach to a written policy? A written policy was needed as there were no internal procedures in this regard to tenders. The written policy was developed and put together with the expertise from the Ministry of Romy 
also the cabinet of the Minister of Romy. Concerning the accountability ordinance, the compatibility test for the ordinance, the government together with the governor have to agree that this is the national procurement policy of the country, as well as there will be involvement with parliament. Next question posed by MP Bryson. Is the minister authorized to create a national procurement policy of the country, St. Martin, and does that fall within the Ministry of Romy? As Minister of Romy, I've created a policy document specifically for the Ministry of Romy in regards to the procurement procedure, so it does not. Next question posed by MP Bryson. The absence for the ability of the minister on his own to create a procurement policy for finance, TIAC, VSR, Justice, ECYET, and RZ. In absence of that, what does the minister believe is the second best thing to do? The Ministry of Romy has always made its expertise available to assist all ministries with the procurement of various projects and will continue to do so, looking to the bigger picture of developing a national procurement policy and guideline for country St. Martin. So basically follow that of what we have established thus far. Does the minister agree with what he did? Let us present a written policy in the, so that the ministry can at least have something to follow so that the next time the systemic investigation comes across, this thing looks, so to avoid the next time a systemic in investigation? Yes, I agree. Then the MP made a statement, because I cannot ask Parliament a question. The statement was a question to the Parliament. What if the minister did nothing? What if the minister simply allowed to put his hands back and allow the ministry to go figure it out? <coughs> I would answer and say from my part, then I believe there will be garbage all over the road and the streets of St. Martin would not be clean. What would have happened come March 1st when the garbage was piling up on the road, if the deadline was not met, I would be faced with coming back to the same parliament for having committed gross negligence in not dealing with it. I now move on to question posed by the honorable member, honorable member of parliament, Brown Bill. What are the improvement points made thus far since the tender? Since the tender of solid waste 2021-2026, the ministry has improved in developing a procurement document which includes that all terms of references must be legally vetted. Bids must also be submitted digitally which protects the applicant and also government. The evaluation committee members should not be all from the same department which was been the case for several years based on what I was told. Guidelines for the advertisement of the attender. A tender report must be made on the documents received the day of the tender. All participants of the tender must be informed officially of their outcome as well as the option to seek clarity if needed. These are all improvement points that we added. How is the evaluation committee established now with the tenders? To you, Madam Chair, to the Honorable Member Brownville. Since the establishment of the tender procurement policy, the evaluation committee is being comprised of various members from departments and or ministries. Evaluation committee members are no longer selected from the same department that was busy with the preparation of said tender documents. Next question to you, Madam Chair. What documents were provided to the Ombudsman that was not included in the report? I mentioned some in the introduction, but I will repeat. The letter of concern from me to the Ombudsman, various memos, and also a response regarding the preliminary findings report. MP Brownville, through you, Madam Chair, also requested for the minister to provide the copy of the procurement policy, which was also sent, as you alluded to, a while ago, to Parliament. How was the functioning of the policy done? How, is, how was the function of the policy done? The policy is a Romy document as such was ratified by my person as Minister of Romy for the purpose of establishing a legal policy guideline within the ministry due to the lack of written policy in our tender procedures. I 
And now move on to the questions question posed by questions posed by MP Heisen Richardson. What changes and, and improvements have the minister made in Vrami over the last two years during your tenure? Since I took office in 2020, various improvements have been made. Just to name a few, establishing of a tender procurement guideline, form a task force for the collection of delayed long lease outstanding canon fees. With these efforts in the ministry, been able to record a record income for 2021. Digital hurricane shelter registration forms, a digital electrical inspection process, the Lebe project in collaboration with the Ministry of TIAT, the completion of the hurricane shelters, the ring road cleanup, private home repairs, the reinstatement of Article 28A, the guideline tender procurement procedure I mentioned that already, also the land issuance policy which is being vetted by the YZ and Way, the legal department, the spatial development strategy was approved. This policy sets the basis and provides the guidelines for making of more detailed policies and legislation on spatial planning, such as zoning, various infrastructure improvements, the cleanup of car wrecks in various districts, which is a continuously ongoing project, collaboration with the Nature Foundation in protecting our environment with the recent signed new SLA, acquiring heavy equipment for the landfill via the NRPB, traffic sign installations, the ship salvaging project which cleaned up our lagoon, the street lights management agreement that we have with GB, the front street emergency repairs, various road repairs and hard surfacing in different areas. I would like to use the Holder B Richardson Road, for example, that is an intersection by Miller Region and Defiance, which was a problem for several years. We were able as a team to get that resolved. The demolition of the former post office, the demolition of the former justice building, the placement of a sea turtle nesting sign at the Mullins Bay Beach along with the National Foundation, commence the renovation and social units repairs in Belvedere, which has been a challenge for quite some time. This is the first time in the history that Belvedere has been undergoing such a major renovation. Introduction of aquafalt for road patching works. The introduction of a job mixer to the ministry to expedite the recruitment process within the ministry. The L.B. Scott Road project, repairing of the well in L.B. Scott Road. The cost cutting to the wastewater treatment plant contract, the cost cutting to the trenches. The pathway and installation of lights at Copper Drive, that is behind the Sister Magda School. That has been a, quite a challenge for our students for quite some years. Now students and residents alike have an easier move through that area. And also the renaming of the Carnival Festival Village to the Jocelyn Arndell Festival Village. Next question posed by MP Heisen Richardson. Have you been doing anything to solve the issue with, the, with Dutch Quarter? Can you please inform Parliament? In regards to the sewage project in Dutch Quarter, the ministry has a positive negotiation with Wynne Roads recently to address the remaining works. Wynne Roads has committed to collaborate and move forward with the ministry and tackle the priority areas of the project. For example, getting the main pump station up and running as well as connecting several homes to the sewage network that would further enhance and improve the residential area. To get the main sewage line up and functioning is one of the key factors in addressing the running sewage water in, Dutch, in the Dutch Quarter community. The detailed plan is currently in the process and is being developed. This, of course, will be communicated to the community as the progress is made moving forward. The remaining works of Dutch Quarter Sewage Project will be executed in phases as, the limitation, as there are limitations that do exist. Madam Chair, I would like to um, make a comment and or request. Uh, I noticed, taking note of the meeting that was held on Monday, and also taking note of documents that were published in the paper, I would like to know if those documents can be provided for me, please. I see that it was CC to the government, but even right before coming here, we have not received those documents. Thank you. And I look forward to any uh, clarification that may be needed from the honorable members of parliament. Thank you, Minister, for your presentations and answers to the questions posed by members of parliament. Would you like a copy of it now, for, for, at this point in time? For 
no, I just make a want, copy because, of it now because what, it was already sent? Um, to what me. happens sometimes is that we see things that documents are sent, but we it's I not double checked email. Completely on your, that your end is yet. I'm, I'm not. I don't want to assume. So I'm just saying, okay. if it wasn't sent, if it can be sent, and if I can be provided with a copy now, as well, I would really appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Officially. Thank you, Minister. We will work on that internally and see if we can get it to you as soon as possible. We have now come to the clarification round for the answers that were um, presented by the Minister, and I see that MP Bryson would like to have the floor for clarification. MP Bryson? Not again. Hello. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon to you, to my colleague, members of Parliament, the Khafir, the Honorable Minister and his team, those in the Tribune and those following this meeting. Madam Chair, I have some clarifications, but I mean, one of those clarifications may um, actually have, I might have to post to you, Madam Chair. Uh, I took note of the email that was received earlier today from the Ombudsman office. Uh, where the reply to the request from the PFP faction to confirm the validity of the documents. I did see that reply come in. However, I did also pose on Monday and asked if you can see if the two additional questions that I had posed, um, you would have forwarded to the Ombudsman office to see if they too would have maybe been able to reply to that. We did not. Okay, because I mean, the same question, the same day that those questions were forwarded Mr. from the PFP faction, Mr. Duggins replied to that. Uh, my two questions you're saying have been left unanswered. So the questions that were sent to uh, the, the request that came in from PFP was a written request. Many requests were made yesterday, or day before yesterday yes. during the meeting in, in, in verbally, but none of the requests that were made verbally we were able to send out as yet. Okay. So the ones that we, that we received written that were sent out. Interesting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to go straight into the clarifications that I have. Um, Madam Chair, the, men, the minister in his answers mentioned a uh, a certain outburst from a member of the committee. Uh, it kind of went pretty quickly, and I didn't quite understand when did this took place. Was this, you're saying, during evaluating the documents? Because he said, a doc, let's say parcel one was awarded, and if I understand correctly, the person made an outburst with a, a obscene language. Are you saying that after the results were known, so at the moment that this individual that was on the evaluating committee heard the result of parcel one. That was the obscene outburst that came from this objective member of the committee that she was visibly and audibly upset about the fact that the other company quality sweepers did not win. Just would like to understand if that is, or was this just some another civil servant kind of sitting on the side and made something like that? Because that's very important to be clear um, on who exactly made such an outburst. I, of course, have no interest in knowing the individual, but just their role, because that definitely puts some context into that statement that you made. And Madam Chair, is the same person who made this outburst extremely upset about what transpired and who ultimately won, were they one of the people that distanced themselves? If they were part of the committee, were they one of the people that distanced themselves from that process? Madam Chair, in response to my questions about the procurement policy. What I was um, really trying to get from the minister, Madam Chair, my question was, um, well, let me, let me just uh, elaborate. My question was about a national procurement policy and whether that falls under the minister of Romy. He did indicate that, um, you know, you do sometimes cooperate with other ministries. But what I'm really getting at, Madam Chair, is that you have been hearing accusations from a faction here that's saying a procurement policy can only be done by national decree. And my question to you was, are you, as Minister of Rami, Madam Chair, through you, the individual responsible for issuing and creating a national decree for the entire procurement of St. Martin? That is what I would like to know, and that was the first part of my question. And the second part of the question, Madam Chair, was in absence of that. So if it is not the Minister of Romy, 
that's playing governor or playing calm, drafting such a policy on his own, what is the second best thing the minister thinks is best to be done? Is that drafting, for example, a policy for the ministry itself? Uh, Madam Chair, I also, some additional clarifications. Madam Chair, in the minister was describing um, the process and there's the evaluation part where there's a checklist, but in the process, the minister is describing that after that, there's a sort of a review process. Can the minister please explain that review process? Is it that once there's a check mark on that box, the process is over, the, the, the bid is awarded, or there is a review process so I can understand what that step entails? Madam Chair, and in that review process, would the minister, for example, consult with other ministries or other ministers or legal experts within that, re well, not the minister, I believe that would be the department head of the SG, or if the minister can clarify what, is, what that review process entails and who it entails, um, do they have to seek or typically seek external advice in that review process? Madam Chair, the minister mentioned uh, quite extensively about the unwritten procedure um, that the ombudsman has listed in it. And I did ask the question, for example, well, how did the ombudsman, how does he believe the ombudsman came to that, Madam Chair? However, I, I of course understand the minister can't be in the seat of the ombudsman to say how she came to that. But what I really want to know is that if there was no unwritten policy, what is the method that the minister himself, so not the ombudsman, but what did the minister was able to investigate that they came up to this unwritten policy? And does he agree or disagree with what the ombudsman said that there's an unwritten policy or not? Because I've heard other members on radio and so on say, no, that's not true. There is a written policy. The ombudsman is saying otherwise. So I need the position of the minister, Madam Chair, on this whole situation of written or unwritten policies. Madam Chair, I had a clarification here regarding the validity of the documents, but I believe the minister did address that. However, if the minister can explain, how would he be able to uh, v you know, confirm the validity of it? When I look at the documents, Madam Chair, they look so. It's clear that the signatures are matching, the dates are there, etc. Um, but I would want to hear from the minister what will be his methodology to actually confirm uh, this issue. Madam Chair, also clarification in the question where the minister responded about the key to this, uh, where this thing is stored. Can the minister maybe explain and give us more of an understanding of physically how this is done? Is there a particular area where this is normally is? Is it a very specific office? Is it a safe? Um, is it in the government building? Is it off premises? Give us an understanding of where this document is. And to be very clear, does the minister possess this key at any time? Would like to know that and have that clarified as well. And Madam Chair, also as a further clarification to that point of the key, if the minister, for example, would want to validate these documents, what would be um, his method for doing that? Would you then call the department head, you go in together? Um, that's what I would like to know. What is the process for then going back, if the need be to go and validate documents or to review anything, or even while the tender was going on, if you want to now grab those documents and send them over to the governor, please outline the steps that are there to make it clear whether that process is transparent and secure or not. Madam Chair, the minister read a, early in his presentation, the minister read from a letter to the ombudsman, which he also sent us in the documentation to parliament, in which, for example, the whole, the examples of people slamming their hand on the uh, committee members slamming their hand and saying this is BS and so on. But in that same letter, Madam Chair, can the minister clarify exactly uh, when this was sent and who is what sent and what instances in this three-page letter, all of these very relevant items, where in the report did they end up? Or where are these instances, references, or evaluated within the report? 
And can the minister ensure that he did submit that in time? Because if the minister just sent this past a deadline, then I can totally understand that this was not incorporated into the report. So what time frame was given to you as minister to make sure that you submit the information? Because if you were late, then you were late, Madam Chair, through you. But if you were on time, please On the water, Madam that. Chair. Yes, MP Peterson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon to the Honorable Minister and the support staff and to my colleagues, Madam Chair. Um, I do not believe that it is up to us as MPs to decide um, within that big package of documents that were received by the Ombudsman which ones, whether or not, should have been included in a report. And I would like to make clear of that narrative because that is what the MP is saying, why it, this letter was not put in the report, but that is not for the MP to decide. That is up for the Ombudsman to decide. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oops, thank you, MP Peterson. Madam MP Chair, I'm not sure how that's even a point of order, but Madam Chair, the Ombudsman, according in your email to us, in referencing why the Ombudsman maybe doesn't need to come, I, she said, and I quote, everything the members of Parliament need to know is in the report. That was from the Ombudsman, Madam Chair. So now if the Minister is providing me with information, it is my role to ask for clarification, because what I'm questioning him, maybe he sent it late. Maybe it's his fault that it was not included in the report. Hence, I'm asking, when did you send that and what deadline was given to you? Because perhaps that is the reason it was not included in the report. Madam Chair, in addition to that, can the minister perhaps provide uh, the minister mentioned that there was interactions right after this letter that he read out, that I just referenced, that after that there would still have been documentation sent to the Ombudsman. In that same vein, because I want to understand if things did not make it in the report, if it's his fault, Madam Chair, then I need acknowledgement of that. So I would like to know what was the final date for any communication post that letter, so from December 29th thereafter. Was there any further communication to the Ombudsman after that? And did that come too late? Final one. And Madam Chair, can the minister explain to us, because again, with especially this sort of sentiment that gets thrown in a nonsensical point of order, how is it possible then that if the minister believes that information is going to the ombudsman, can the minister then explain what he chooses and how he chooses to send information to the ombudsman? What decision making goes in that when you're dealing with a systemic investigation or you're dealing with reports to come to government? Who advises the minister on this? Is it the department head? Is the minister on his own just decides what to send? Um, who advises the minister to ensure that um, this information is sent? And has the minister perhaps done similarly like other ministries, appointed a contact person that can act as a liaison to ensure that the minister is providing the information to the respectable ombudsman to make sure that she gets the information that she deserves and that she requires? Because I think it's very important for the minister to show some sort of, of willingness and effort to, sub to show the respected ombudsman those documents. Madam Chair, those will be all my clarifications. Thank you. Thank you, MP Bryson. Is there any other member of Parliament that wish to have the floor for clarifications? I see MP Westcott Williams. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, lady, and a good afternoon. Good afternoon to all. Good afternoon to the minister and his support staff. Madam Chair, lady, there was one question that I posed in the first round of this meeting, and that was whether the minister feels that the report as we have received it from the Ombudsman has, could have any potential consequences financially or otherwise for the government. If so, what does the minister believe these consequences can be? And if not, why not? Thank you, Madam Chair Lee. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Again, I ask if there's any other member of parliament that wish to have the floor for clarifications in the final round. I see MP Emmanuel, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And good afternoon to the Honorable Minister, his support staff, the people of St. Martin, and everyone who is watching and listening. Madam Chair, let me just have about one or two clarifications for the minister. Madam Chair, lady, as I go through the report, 
the, the Honorable Minister read and said that it was unfortunate that things he was expecting to see in the report from the Ombudsman wasn't there. And he sent, these, he sent information and documents to the Ombudsman and they did not respond. I'm asking the Minister, is the Minister here saying that the Ombudsman did not respond to his queries, to his queries after getting the systemic investigation? Because in the, in the, in the report on page 33, on page 33, the minister read, the minister has taken note that your preliminary findings report does not include mention or comment on the many additional documentations, including internal communications that the ministry has provided from the onset of your investigation. The ministry also sent an additional letter of concerns, which was also signed by the acting secretary general and the acting department head of infrastructure management, which were also not followed up on by your office, nor does it appear to have been included in the drafting of the preliminary findings. Is the minister saying that the ombudsman did not respond? Madam Chair, I just want clarifications to the information that he sent. Is that what the minister is saying? Also, in addition to that, I would like to ask the honorable minister through you, Madam Chair, the minister made mention about the individuals on the committee. Is the minister saying that none of the individuals in the committee left before the tendering process was done? Before the tendering process was done? Those are my two questions for clarification, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Emmanuel. Again, I turn the floor to members of parliament that wish to have the floor for clarification. Going once, going twice, I see no need. I turn the floor over now to the minister. Minister, do you have, are you able to respond to the clarifications immediately or would you need some time to? Thank you, Madam Chair, Lady. Thank you to the honorable members of parliament for the clarification questions posed. However, I will require time to, to go over all these points. How long would you need, minister? We need a lace pause too, so it kind of will work better with some of the documents that you're given. So we need some time to um, read as well, so maybe we can work perfectly okay. together. So no is 20 minutes okay for you? Okay. Give me a half an hour. Half an hour? Half okay, an hour, perfect. Please, half you. an hour, we'll take the time to read some of the documents that came in from the minister. We will now adjourn this Point meeting bottom, for Madam 30 Chair. minutes. Bottom, Chair. MP, MP, Imani. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, is a half an hour for the minister to decide whether he's going to need more time to answer the clarifications no, or no, he's no, going to The minister will, re I just will want to return make sure with, with the clarification answers in 30 minutes and at the meantime, some of the members Thank of you. parliament would like to read some of the documentations that came in. So we're going to take a adjournment for 30 minutes, meeting adjourned until then. I see MP West, M MP, Minister, M MP, MP. Your microphone. M Madam Chair, lady. Yes. The, are we going to be receiving the answers provided up to now in writing? We received the questions, but are Minister? we going to receive the answers in writing as well? Makes no sense to have the questions booked in as parliament, at Parliament, which we posed, and not the answers in writing. Thank you. Minister, are you able to um, send us the answers in writing? Madam Chair, some of the answers in writing, and I added certain things, that's why I... I mean, I think we had this discussion already in the past that if questions are posed verbally and they're responded to verbally, I think that's based on the rules of order. So I would not want to give something because in between, you know, you say something extra or you subtract something. So I think that is uh, fair enough. Thank you, Minister. Thank Members you. of Parliament, we will now take a brief adjournment for 30 minutes. Meeting adjourned until then.
Good evening and welcome back, members of parliament. We just took a brief adjournment to give clarity on the clarifications that was posed by members of parliament. And with that, I would like to now turn the floor over to the minister for the clarifications. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Just to give a brief update on the clarifications posed, the min member of parliament, MP Bryson, are you saying that after the results were known, the EC member that visibly and I'll be upset was that the role, what was the role of that person? Yes, after the preliminary results were made known, the person had an outburst in the evaluation committee that mentioned that this is BS and do you know how these persons worked? And the second point was, was this person a member of the committee? As I mentioned, yes. In the process, there is a checklist. Who reviews after that checklist? The checklist is part of round one of the evaluation process. After the checklist is filled in by the evaluation committee, the findings are presented to the department head, who then has to agree which companies can proceed to round two, also with the SG. I am not provided with this document, and I have no influence on this document in any way. <clears throat> the next clarification. If there was no unwritten policy, what was the position of the minister on written versus unwritten? After further fact-finding, there actually was an unwritten policy. However, the unwritten information was privy only to select a few within the only to a selected few within the department. My position on this matter that is pre it presents a situation where, as principles of good governance cannot be guaranteed, thus the ministry has established written guidelines which has since been published. And as I mentioned in the previous round with answering questions, this was requested by the then se section head and ultimately only provided in 2022, which is uh, about two weeks ago. What is the second point or fifth point of clarification from MP Bryson? What is the methodology to verify the documents? The original documentation would need to be compared to the leaked documentation. This, in my opinion, should be done by experts in the field. The original documents is located behind lock and key. The location is the office of the department head, similar to the other documents of this nature. <clears throat> MP then posed a question, was the location of the, what is the location? Are they located in a safe? Who is in possession? As I mentioned, the keys are in the possession of the department head and remains in the possession of only the department head. I have never been in possession of such keys, nor as any member of my cabinet, or anyone else for that matter. What is the process to access the documents? The documents are in the office, again, as I mentioned, of the de department head. If the documents need to be accessed, the department head would need to be consulted to provide entry into his office. What is the time frame given to submit? Was the letter of concern submitted to the Ombudsman on time? Yes, the information was submitted in a timely manner to the office of the Ombudsman prior to the preliminary findings report I mean, sorry, prior to the final report of the Ombudsman, the letter of concern was submitted on December 29, 2021, and the final report of the Ombudsman was received on June 27, 2022. So approximately six months. Was there any further communication to the Ombudsman after December? I would have to verify which communications, but I believe there were because it always con we always communicate on different points but I'll just have to verify that specific point, which I can provide after. Who advises the minister on what information to send to the ombudsman? The relevant department heads and our staff advises, advise me accordingly. Clarification posed by MP Westcott Williams, or question that was missed and now posed again. Does the minister feel that the report received from the ombudsman have a financial consequences for the government? If yes, what? If not, why not? As minister, I cannot predict the future, but I can make an estimation based on my understanding of the facts and circumstances at hand. It is in my opinion that the Ombudsman report will not have any financial consequences for the government of St. Martin. The Ombudsman report does, go into, <clears throat> does not go into any financial consequences based on her findings. As for the second part of the question about the consequences, as I stated before, but wish to elaborate here, 
Even before the final report was presented to me, I already published an internal procurement policy document to facilitate the principles of good governance, which includes transparency and fairness. So in that regard, the report supports my position of taking unwritten practices from the former ministers and put it into a written format so that everyone is aware of how bids and et cetera will be handled in the ministry. Additionally, I've also stated that suggestions of the Ombudsman have already been applied into upcoming and past tenders as both the Ombudsman Office and the Ministry continue to strive towards improving the working relationship between our offices, which will best benefit the people of St. Martin. <clears throat> Clarification by MP Emmanuel through you, Madam Chair. Is the Minister saying that the Ombudsman did not respond to his queries? No, I said that crucial information which was provided was not included in the final report. Second clarification, is the minister saying that none of the members left before the process was done? As I mentioned, I believe three times in the answering, one member resigned and two members distanced themselves after the evaluation phase was over, claiming that the tender did not go according to the department procedure. Those same members continued throughout the entire process. <clears throat> Last point, Madam Chair, I was able to um, receive the documentation that was provided to Parliament, and um, based on a quick review, I must say that these documents seem to be altered, whereas you can see there's white out, yes and no, so these will have to be confirmed by expert, and I'll come back after the investigation is done. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for your clarification in this round, Minister. We have now come to the end of round one. We will now move over to round two. And the first member of parliament on the speaker's list in round two is MP Melissa Gums and MP Gums. Please uh, take note that you do have 10 minutes in this round. So you are about to start in. You can start now. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, good evening to you, my colleagues, again, those joining us, and good evening to the minister and his support staff. <clears throat> Madam Chair, lady, I, um, I read the 27-page document that we received today, and, you know, something funny is that many people don't believe that when we write, we also use a tone, and that tone comes through in everything you write, your letters, your WhatsApps, all written communication. So it was disheartening for me to see the position that managers within the Ministry of Rami, and even in this presentation the minister himself took, in those emails and how they handled the staff that they earlier championed as persons who worked hard and invested in a good outcome. There is integrity in someone knowing the limitations of their knowledge and skill and communicating that effectively with those in management. And it's a shame to see that painted as insubordination and responded to in a condescending manner. The hilarious part is that that email chain did not have anything to do with the topic at hand. It was about a wastewater treatment plant, so that was a little confusing for me. But I digress. Madam Chair, lady, two months since the first round of this meeting, after a host of very public, very embarrassing attempts at discrediting the valid logic and reasoning behind the motion of no confidence that I will read shortly, it is my sincerest hope that this report has been read and digested not just by my colleagues, but by those in the public as well. As I said in my first round remarks, maintaining the status quo by tweeting, tweaking it to suit individual purposes and goals has been a thing that every legacy party has worked hard to maintain on the, in this country since the 1970s. And that has continued with this tendering process, and Madam Chair Lady, it will continue until a government prioritizes the establishment of an El Beham a national decree containing general measures that complies with and satisfies Article 47.6 of the National Accountability Ordinance. To remind the viewing public, this El Beham would regulate the tendering process for the entirety of government, thus adding a layer of responsible financial control to the management of country funds. A big deal has been made about the tender policy published in January 2022 and that we received today in Parliament um, by the Ministry of Rami, calling it a step towards fixing the problems in the ministry. Madam Chair Lady, I really want to stress to the public, to my colleagues, that celebrating half-baked attempts to fix things is like clapping for a fish because it could swim. 
but even more critical, celebrating half-baked attempts to fix things that are at their core counter to the law is an exercise in madness. To continue to attempt to insult our intelligence, this policy doesn't even stipulate conditions that would disqualify a company, which is odd because in every tour, whether it's garbage collection, marketing, graphic design, uh, even baking, there are conditions that would lead a company to be disqualified. Otherwise, anyone can bring in any document whenever they want, in whatever state they want, submit any quality bid they want, and be considered. It's not a very efficient process. Truly fixing it would mean establishing the el Baham as prescribed by the law. No long talk, just establish it. I said in the first round that not having this el Baham and instead having individual policies written by ministries opens the door for a lack of transparency and continuity throughout the bidding process. It lays the foundation for what can be called bid rigging, particularly when we consider what was known prior to Monday and what is known now. Prior to Monday, Madam Chair Lady, what was known in that in footnote 38 on page 17 of the final report, the Office of the Ombudsman stated, because the Minister of Rami has refused to provide the individual evaluation sheets for the completeness of the tender documents signed by the evaluation committee members, the Ombudsman was unable to verify these statements. Prior to Monday, Madam Chair Lady, what was known is that in the June 28, 2022 statement from the Ministry of Rami posted on the government's Facebook page, which the minister graciously read out loud for us in the first round of this meeting, towards the end it reads, the ministry is of the opinion that it has provided the requested documentation as well as additional documentation to the Ombudsman and that it has therefore complied with the investigation of the Ombudsman. But on Monday, Madam Chair Lady, Parliament received submitted documents, anonymously received, that prove just why the El Baham I spoke about is so critical. <clears throat> the Office of the Ombudsman stated in their report that two companies that had previously been disqualified in the evaluation round, according to testimony received during the investigation by members of the committee, were suddenly back in contention. One of them, after their missing bank information, which is what disqualified them, was discovered. The public will recall the footnote in the report that I just read out that the individual sheets for the completeness of tender documents which were signed off by the committee members were not received by the Ombudsman. Then there is the postscript attached to the report at page 34, which I'd like to quote. As the voice and protector of the people, the Ombudsman, together with the General Audit Chamber and the Council of Advice, also supports Parliament in their supervisory role vis-a-vis -vis the government. The ministers are accountable to Parliament, and Parliament, in turn, presents the entire population of, represents the entire population of St. Martin. In order to execute its task, the Ombudsman is dependent on having the necessary information at its disposal. The National Ordinance, therefore, confers an information right on the Ombudsman and imposes an information obligation on administrative bodies. On government lies the obligation to provide information to the Ombudsman. In other words, refusing to provide the Ombudsman information or concluding that the information already provided is thorough and complete, while multiple persons have confirmed the existence of the information, is unacceptable. By declining to provide information, the Minister of Rami was therefore handling in contravention of the law, thereby effectively undermining the role of the institution, a High Council of State, which has been anchored in the Constitution. Madam Chair Lady, the documents received by Parliament are indeed the individual completeness checklist, some of them, which the Minister stated should have been in the packet sent to the Ombudsman's office. The Ombudsman's office responded to the documents that they received from Parliament, stating that they had not received these completeness checks. I reviewed those documents and the Ombudsman's response with other points from the final report in mind. The testimony regarding changes to the terms of reference, the bank statement that appeared after the fact, the claim that an entire box went unchecked, but then the fact that the checklist shows a full evaluation. <clears throat> I'm going to read the motion now, Madam Chair Lady, but I just want to state as a tip, when you take on a title, you don't just take on the ribbon cotton, the photo ops, and the cocktail events. You take on the risk and the responsibility, and because of the title you carry, that risk is yours alone to carry, not your employees. As I mentioned earlier and in the first round, I'll now read the motion of no confidence. The Parliament of St. Martin, in its meeting of today, Wednesday, August 17, 2022, considering 
that after the awarding process of the Solid Waste Collection 2021-2026 complaints were filed with the Ombudsman against the Minister of Romy by multiple bidders that participated in the collection of solid waste tendering, who expressed concerns regarding the credibility, reliability, and transparency of the process, that the Ombudsman informed the Minister of Romy on August 27, 2021, that the Bureau Ombudsman had referred, refrained from further investigating the aforementioned complaints and would proceed with a systemic investigation into the tendering and awarding process of solid waste collection 2021-2026, which then started on September 17, 2021. That the Ombudsman, in accordance with Article 21 of the National Ordinance Ombudsman, submitted a final report on the investigation. That the conclusion of the final report was that the Minister of Rami failed to provide critical information to the Ombudsman in her investigation and that the tendering and awarding process was neither fair nor sufficiently transparent. The documentation received has proven that the minister misled the Office of the Ombudsman, a High Council of State, as well as Parliament and the public when he stated that all required documents had been provided to the Office of the Ombudsman. That the Minister of Rami received a motion of disapproval on 20th October 2021 by the Parliament of St. Martin for his questionable handling of the Vineyard Heights long lease land and up to date has failed to fix the issue and complete the terms of the motion. That the Ombudsman, as of September 28, 2021, is busy with a systemic investigation into the Vineyard Heights situation, and that there's no confidence that the conclusions of that report would be any different from the conclusions of this report. That there are other internal, external, and equally critical issues occurring within the Ministry of Rami, and where the Minister's jurisdiction reaches, including the continu continuing situation at the country's only electricity provider, NVGEBE. That the Minister has consistently shown indifference with regards to his own accountability when confronted with these critical issues and that Parliament has no confidence that he's able to fix them. Declares that as a result hereof, these actions of the Minister of Romney must be deemed in conflict with the principles of good governance and accountability and resolves that the Minister of Romney, Mr. Egbert J. Duran, no longer enjoys the confidence of the Parliament of St. Martin and goes over to the order of the day. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Gums. Next on the speaker's list, oh, is the motion supported, MP Gums, by, by one, two, okay, perfect. Thank you, MP Gums. Next on the speaker's list, we have MP Rayon Peterson. Go ahead, MP Peterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. A good evening to yourself, to the Krefir, to my honorable colleagues, to the minister and your support staff, and to everybody else tuned in. Madam Chair, the meeting of today is pretty clear cut, but instead today, we will most likely see a public display of political showmanship, as has been seen. Why? Because accountability is something that this coalition seems to be structurally lacking. Throughout recess, we saw many deflection tactics, from baseless personal attacks to members of parliament, based on threats and lies, to diversion tactics by other ministers concerning projects that they then supported. All of that to take away the attention from the topic at hand, which is the systemic investigation from my High Council of State, the Ombudsman. The contents of the report are damning, to say the least. Let me start off by saying that the minister's presentation did not change my sentiment at all towards the case. We have publicly discussed these many times, and it paints a clear picture as to how and when the deception took place. By, by the end of the tender, the committee consisted of three persons while it started off with seven. It is also good to note that the financial controller of Romy, a lady who I personally know of standing integrity as per her job description, was, one, was actually the first one to leave the seven-man committee. Maybe it's also good to note that since then, the good lady has quit. She left the ministry because of the obvious corruption that's taken place. The then new department head asked for assistance, but why couldn't the legal policy advisor in Romy help the department? Why couldn't the, uh, the quality controller help? Why did it have to be political appointees, cabinet members? We received documents that turned out to have been excluded from the package that was sent to the Ombudsman. Documents that were officially requested by our High Council of State, the Ombudsman. These documents painted a totally different picture than what is mentioned in the report on page 17. On this page, it says, during the hearings, when questioned about the document being overlooked, the cabinet members struggled to explain the incident coherently. One cabinet member stated that a document was overlooked. Another one said that one of the boxes was not evaluated and or one of the parcels was not evaluated. As a result, they had to be redone. Upon further questioning, the clarification was given that one bid was overlooked, the entire bid from Aviana. 
The other cabinet staffer indicated that the box that had Aviani's documents was also overlooked. Yet, in the documents that we received on Monday, it specifically has a document pertaining to this company with seven signatures on the day of the start of the tender. Food for thought. So according to the Ombudsman report, it was completely overlooked. Yet, on this document, we have the seven signatures, while the tender was actually completed with three signatures. We confirmed today that the Ombudsman did not get these documents. Now, when it comes to the validity of these documents, through you, Madam Chair, they can be verified easily. Call up those seven persons and put them on the oath. And we can ask them if that document is real or not. It's very simple. But when the documents were revealed, the deflection tactics were immediate. Civil servants and their integrity were put into question. Bear in mind, for documents that the Ombudsman officially asked for in her systemic investigation, the minister chose to decide for himself that she did not require these documents, as per page four of the Ombudsman report. My one question that I have to you, Madam Chair, is not even to the minister. My question is to the governor's office, because I would very much like to know if they too did not receive these documents, because here is where our accountability ordinance comes into play. The El Beham, the national decree containing general measures that is so desperately needed now comes into play because the law is there. So I do not understand a statement from the minister to you, Madam Chair, that Parliament has to come with a tendering law. The law is there to you, Madam Chair. Article 47, paragraph 6 of the National Accountability Ordinance that says that an LB hum is needed, not a national ordinance from, from Parliament. You know, and this also goes in line with what the Minister of Finance said on the floor of Parliament, where, and I paraphrase, he said that we do not need any more um, financial uh, management laws because he thinks that we have enough while we do not have the LB home in place. The fact is, to you, Madam Chair, the tender procurement policy as it is now is illegal, non-binding, and has absolutely no legal weight at all. It has zero legal basis. Vromi currently has one legally qualified civil servant, and he did not vet this policy at all neither, and that can be checked as well. Actually, on top of that, the terms of reference for the tender were also not, ve not vetted by the one legal in Vromi. So this document, this procurement policy, is just a personal document made by the minister maybe with the help of his personal lawyer, that the minister now is unlawfully using. There is no other word to describe it. And we need to stop praising these mediocre effects to circumvent the law that are, that's there to protect the people. A second best thing is irrelevant in this case. It's dwingend recht in a national ordinance. The minister, to you, Madam Chair, just stood here and also tried to discredit the Ombudsman again by saying that her investigation was incomplete, but he did not mention in the same breath that he is the one who did not send her all of the relevant documentation that he is now questioning. Even worse than that is that the minister stood here and just criticized his own staff, but praising the obvious group of three managers within the ministry that have clearly been his accomplices in all of these matters. With all due respect, minister, to you, Madam Chair, who cares who reacted in a way during the meeting? Who cares who slammed their hand on the table? I have personally seen every member of the current management team of Vromi get on bad in that building myself included, but that doesn't change the fact that the three signatures on the last documents of the tender only include two cabinet members and one of those same managers. The same civil servants were not part of the final decision, period. And I also went through those 27 documents, Madam Chair, and there was absolutely nothing relevant in there in regards to the tender and the concerns made by the Ombudsman. None of it would have been taken up in the Ombudsman report, to my legal opinion, because they're irrelevant to the topic at hand. It contains personal emails and a letter from the minister to the Ombudsman regarding the wastewater treatment plant. And that's it. This is a clear deflection tactic again to throw everybody off track. Once again, what a shame. So blaming civil servants that are constantly put through controversy for your own doings is something that I will not let stand here on the floor of parliament to you, Madam Chair. Maybe the minister to you, Madam Chair, should be reminded that since his tenure, more than 10 persons left the Ministry of Romy. They quit, some of whom were there even before I started working back in the ministry in 2016. These are the facts. And this is a classic case of throwing your own people under the bus because you yourself have to face the music, whether it's from the 70s or the 90s. The minister fails to assume once again his ministerial responsibility by law for his ministry. So, the packet of emails and correspondence that we received today is interesting, but not on topic. I'd actually be, be more interested in the minutes of that secret meeting that was held by the Beauty Crystal Restaurant in Sucker Garden at night when these tenders were ongoing. We have a good MP who also chose to do an internet live interview whilst not being here to represent the people for the last six months. When will it become time to step down as this is what's best for the country at the moment? Article 49 of the Constitution states that if an MP is not present on the island for more than eight months, that he gives up his seat. 
I personally believe that this should be shortened to a maximum of three months because it cannot be that the intention of the law was that an MP can go on sick leave for six, seven months, come back for two weeks, and then leave once again to start off that eight-month period fresh. The people need representation, and the honorable thing to do is let the next person in line, chosen by the people, take up his task for the country of St. Martin. But instead of that, you hear the opposite rumors. How the young professional is to be kept out of parliament at any cost, and how the highest vote getter needs to come back. You even have others, so-called seasoned politicians, who go on the radio, and instead of looking at the facts at hand, choose to deflect by focusing on the amount of votes that individuals get. Because that's what it's all about for these factions, these legacy parties, the numbers. It is not about the actions of those who they choose to put in the executive seats of this country. No, it's about protecting the ones who secured the most votes during the last elections. Politics. Because if they were about the actions of their own ministers rather than the amount of votes, then guess what? They would have sent some of these ministers home themselves. And we have to sometimes play devil's advocate regarding the usual spin that they take. So I will do that now. Maybe continuity will be jeopardized, for example. I believe that is false. That's why we have a system in place that assigns a replacement minister in the absence of one. Bear in mind, assigned, not chosen, like the minister, to you, Madam Chair, chose to do when it became the issuance of land for his personal family members. That's when he chose to ask the Minister of Finance personally, if he would be his accomplice in that case, to sign off on documents that were a conflict of interest to begin with. Let me remind the people of Samadhan of one thing, through you, Madam Chair. Accountability does not stop in the minister's seat. Accountability goes all the way, whether it's for ministers or for members of parliament who were ministers. Another tactic that is used is the questioning of the ministers, much like was done in round one. And it's funny, Madam Chair, because the minister himself at some point throughout these last two months to you said that these questions were not urgent, so they did not need to be delivered within two weeks. But that is a tactic that will be used once again, probably, asking the ministers a bunch of irrelevant questions, questions that can be answered by reading the report, but thus to give the minister the opportunity to say that he needs time to come back and bring back the answers. I urge you, Madam Chair, to protect the people from St. Martin from these obvious tricks once again. Another tactic, but a very obvious one, Madam Chair, is the walking out of public meetings, thus breaking quorum. I plead the people of St. Martin to just pay attention, pay attention. Me, personally, Madam Chair, to you, I don't think I have any other choice but to support this motion if I were to be serious about my task as a member of parliament. Because holding ministers accountable for their actions is one of our most important tasks, if not the most important. The minister has clearly shown to you, Madam Chair, that he wants to be wrong and strong and has absolutely no remorse for his condemned actions by our High Council of State. How long are we going to ignore the facts? Madam Chair, I can only imagine what the spin and deflection tactic is going to be after all of these facts have been put to the table. I am patiently waiting, just as the rest of us tuned in, to see where they would take it this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Peterson. Next on the speakers list, we have MP Christoph Emmanuel. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair Lady. Madam Chair Lady, to the Honorable Minister, I would like to ask him, can he provide the letter of the 14th of January, 2022, that was sent to him by the Ombudsman? You see, Madam Chair Lady, when I read this document on page 33, responds Minister of Romy in his letter of June 6, 2022, the minister writes to the Ombudsman, June 6, 2022, the minister writes to the Ombudsman. And in this, in this letter that I read earlier, he said, and I'm going to go from in the paragraph, the ministry also sent an additional letter of concerns, which was also signed by the Secretary General and the Acting Department Head of Infrastructure Management, which were also not followed up. On by your office, nor does it appear to have been included in the drafting of the preliminary findings. That's why I'm asking for that letter that was sent to him in January. Madam Chair Lady, the 14th of January, 2022. So here you have a letter that was sent the 14th of January, 2022. 
The minister responds, in June. <laughs> Madam Chair Lady, I would like to also ask through you, Madam Chair, the minister said that the documents are altered and they will need experts. Who are the experts that the minister think should review those documents for their authenticity, whether they are valid or not? Through you, Madam Chair, I would like to ask the Honorable Minister, did you send those documents in the packet advice to the governor? Did you? Did the governor receive those documents? You see, Madam Chair Lady, the minister said that individuals recuse themselves or are withdrawn. Madam Chair Lady, when I read 4.3, resignation, departure of committee members, it says, from the inception of the evaluation process, completeness of the validity of documents check, there were many discussions regarding the application and interpretation of the terms of reference according to the committee members. During the completeness check, there were personal opinions on how the terms of reference should be interpreted, which frustrated the process. Irregular activities were observed by some committee members, such as cabinet members, requesting the key to enter the room where the documents were safely stored without the other committee members being present and copies being made. It must be noted that the senior management of the ministry, including the minister, has refuted the claim. As a result of the aforementioned, members resigned. And members are plural. Members resigned from the committee due to concerns in the evaluation of the document process and not adhering to the unwritten tendering of policy guidelines, nor the requirements in the terms of reference. The first resign was a controller. A member from the contract management team was subsequently pulled out from the committee after the first round by the department head to focus on price calculations, which is the final step in the evaluation process. The resignation of three other members from the contract management team followed. So I'm asking through you, Madam Chair Lady, who recused themselves? Because if the first person, the controller, resigned and three others resigned, that makes four individuals. Four. So then who else from the team, according to the minister, recused themselves? Madam Chair. Madam Chair Lady, the minister came and he read a letter from committee members to the department head saying that you're going to take full responsibility. I'll also like to read one to Madam Chair. Good morning, Mr. Sherman. I took note from this email sent. I do not appreciate that you, as a department head, will take full responsibility of the contents of report number five. But you are also responsible for all other decisions taken during this tender. Mr. Sherman, I would like to state the following. The tender did not go in accordance to the department procedures. We had a lot of outside interferences, which made this one quite difficult. Besides that, the part that all legal parties and top management were involved with the decision taken was quite informational. Mr. Sherman, just to be on the same page, I wanted to be clear that I was only involved with the first step which was the evaluation of the documents and the validity of these and also the points break down. The part of calculation process started, start the end. I was not part of this. Madam Chair, lady, it is so much concerning this tendering, so much. And the minister comes and he pick and chooses exactly what he wants to tell the, the member of parliament and the people of St. Martin. It is so much. But because of my time, I can't read it all. So the minister comes and he says, this is from one of them that says, you know, Mr. George, I, I leave it up to you since you take full responsibility. I have that too as well, but I have much more, Madam Chair Lady. I have much more, you know? So then since, since, since we need legal expert, then Madam Chair Lady, then the prosecutor's office should be the legal expert to go and verify and see if these documents are authentic to see if these documents are authentic, Madam Chair Lady. 
Because the minister is coming here picking and choosing exactly what I should give to the members of parliament and what I shouldn't give to the members of parliament. Madam Chair, lady, the wellness check, all those documents that the, that the, that the minister pick out and just say, oh, here's a little white out. What happened to all the rest of them? What happened to all the rest of them? All the rest of them are altered? All the rest of them are altered. The question is, Madam Chair, why weren't they sent to the ombudsman when she requested them? The minister said it's outside of her scope of the investigation. Well, it, that may not be what you said in those words. Yeah. Through you, Madam Chair Lady. Okay, through you. But then even if that was not said, a question to the Honorable Minister, did the Ombudsman request the, well, the, 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 the checks in the first round? Did the Ombudsman request them? And did you send them to the Ombudsman? In addition to that, Madam Chair Lady, all of them that we have here, all of them, all of these documents that we have here, Madam Chair, all of them, all of them, did this, all of these, all of them, did they make a part of the advice sent to the governor with all the signatures on them? Did they make a part of the advice? Because, Madam Chair, lady, the three signatures that went to the advice doesn't have the controller on it, the financial controller. Did these make up part of the advice that was sent to the governor? And if no, why not? Madam Chair Lady, I thank you. Thank you, MP Emmanuel. Next, on the speaker's list, we have MP George Pantaflet. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to the chair, my colleagues, those that are viewing, those that are listening to this meeting. Madam Chair, indeed, 10 minutes is a short time, but I know exactly why it's like this in second round to, to avoid a lot of uh, chit chat and um, sometimes nonsensical statements. Madam Chair, I, I hope that you permit me to make use of Article 62 of the Rules of Order which say that every member of parliament has the right to pose questions to the minister. And the minister has to answer these questions within a reasonable time. So therefore, I'll pose my questions. Question number one. According to the TOR or the term of reference, the tender should be submitted in triplicate, failure of which would lead to an automatic disqualification. Were all tenders submitted in triplicate? And if no, how many tenders were disqualified because of this? Were any bidders given the opportunity to rectify this? Question number two. The talk further states that an evaluation committee of the Ministry of Romney consisting of minimum three members, will evaluate the received tenders. It was chosen to have an evaluation committee comprising of seven persons. Was there a specific reason for this? Kindly explain. Number three, there are serious concerns that contracts have been awarded to bidders who didn't submit the lowest bid. Has this happened in the past? Please explain why this is possible based on, awarding, on the awarding system. Number four, one of the documents every bidder had to submit was a bank statement indicating the financial capacity of the company. What was the purpose of this document and where in the process did it play a role? Question number six, what is your opinion on the participation of sole proprietorships in contracts of such magnitude, like the garbage contracts? Should this be maintained for the future? Do you agree, through Madam Chair, Minister, that more time should be given to contractors to have equipment like garbage trucks, etc., 
in place in order to be compliant with the contract. One should not reasonably expect a contractor to purchase trucks before it is guaranteed that a contractor has won at the least one parcel. Question number eight. It appears that contractors feel that the tender process was not started on time. Could you please share your thoughts on this? Madam Chair, through to the Minister, the Ombudsman concludes that the term of reference was poorly prepared and had a late start of preparations for tendering. What is your reaction to this? Do you share the opinion of the Ombudsman? Question number 10. Meanwhile, a package of evaluation sheets has been leaked and booked in at Parliament. Is the minister aware of this? I guess you received a copy today. And can the minister confirm that these documents are copies of original? You already made your statement on that, so that's all, that answer has already been given. Madam Chair, to the minister, to you, I understood that you requested the Ombudsman to have the previous tender investigated. What is the outcome of that request? Question number 12. Based on the Ombudsman report on page 18, it is written, the Minister of Rumi requested the department to head to investigate these allegations and to report his findings via memo of March 19, 2021. Can this memo, together with all correspondence be re related to this investigation, be, be, provide, be provided to Parliament? What was the outcome of this investigation? Madam Chair, I always have a hard time trying to balance between Integrity and professionalism, calling names on the floor of parliament, in the present, with the, without the presence of persons to defend themselves. But again, Madam Chair, this meeting is proving again that prior to this taking place, we should have met with the ombudsman. Because I have questions for the ombudsman, Madam Chair. What makes us think that the conclusion of the Ombudsman is correct? It can be final, but is it correct, Madam Chair? I didn't have a chance to question the Ombudsman. So it means that any report that comes from anybody, High Council of State or not, respectable or not, it behooves us as members of Parliament to scrutinize, to make sure, and to question the individual. And I like the heading of the newspaper that came out in the article. It says that we handle the, 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 the um, systemic investigation without the ombudsman. So I'm saying I don't have all the facts yet because I have not been able to pose the questions to the ombudsman that I have concerning this report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Pontiflet. And next on the speaker's list, we have MP Rolando Bryson. You have the floor. Madam Chair, thank you. And uh, as per my request, if the document I would like to present on the screen is presented. Madam Chair, as you heard from the opposition members speaking before me, in a 10-minute presentation, I can basically summarize what the members of parliament or the members of the opposition are boiling this down to, which is they believe that the minister has been involved in some form of bid rigging, particularly with this company right here that is before you, Aviana Cleanup and Construction, Madam Chair. And the main evidence that we see them touting over and over is that the bank statement appeared out of nowhere, and because of the bank statement appearing out of nowhere, Aviana, a company related, well, in familial relations to the minister has been awarded a contract. Madam Chair, in front of us, indeed, you have a document that I won't question the validity of, to be very clear. The document looks very valid to me. I see the signatures, I see the dates. And indeed, 
on the point, I believe it's point 11, you see the bank statement, it says no. So Madam Chair, how is it indeed possible that this company won a contract? How? Why were they not disqualified? Well, Madam Chair, they were disqualified. If we can go to the next slide. Madam Chair, this is parcel five. The same documents that were presented by the PFP faction, this document shows under number 11, bank statement, financial capacity company, it's there. So all of the hoopla that we've been hearing for months, that the missing bank statements is the reason why uh, uh, appear out of nowhere and all of this to allow Aviana to receive the contract, it states on those documents that it's there. Madam Chair, with regards to the point of the sole proprietorship, is there an issue, um, Fifi? Okay. With regards to these same documentation, Madam Chair, the proof of the sole proprietorship document is indeed missing. This is an example of where the review process that I asked in clarification, that matters. Madam Chair, in the review process, it was checked to see what the sole proprietor is, whether that document is valid because a sole proprietor is the business and the business is the sole proprietor. Madam Chair, if it is that that document is deemed invalid, yes, they have to be disqualified. I fully agree. Those were the documents that were waived in Parliament. So how did Aviana still get this contract, Madam Chair? Well, Madam Chair, in the review process, and I actually went myself to the courts next door and applied for this document. In that document, it states that, indeed, if I ask for a sole proprietor, you get it in the name of the company because in the eyes of the law, the company is the sole proprietor and the sole proprietor is the company. Madam Chair, this is just to illustrate because I'm very disappointed about one thing in this process to start off with that local companies that in a normal review process of an ombudsman would be referred to, for example, as company A, company B, company C, are now being dragged into a situation of public scrutiny and accusations of bid rigging. And at the end of the day, we all serve all of these local people, all these different businesses that were whether treated unfairly or not, we serve them all, Madam Chair. And here is the documentation that was provided from the PFP. I don't question the validation of this. But Madam Chair, in the terms of reference, it states failure to submit such documents disqualifies you. So indeed, if there's a failure to submit the documentation, they should be disqualified. But again, according to the Ombudsman report on page 21, that was the parcel that was indeed granted to that company. So where is the connection between the missing bank statement and this? Madam Chair, the issue of whether the minister has been involved intensely and in all of that is something that still needs to be determined. I don't get that evident from it, from this whole situation. This information shows me that actually there's a lot of sides to this thing in the committee and their actions or their personal interests, I don't know. I am not here to levy accusations. I ask clarifications based on what the minister then says is taking place or what is not taking place. But there are questions that need to be answered. But Madam Chair, I will say, this is the most conflicted I have ever been since serving as a member of parliament. Because the fact of the matter is, Madam Chair, if these documentations could have helped exonerate the minister or local businesses and given clarity to what really took place, then indeed the question does remain, why were these documents not shared with the Ombudsman? Because I'm pleased to see that this opportunity by going through these documents and reviewing them more, perhaps more clarity can be given and any assertions that these companies were local companies were involved in any wrongdoing can be made clear. But that is unfortunately not the case today, Madam Chair. So yes, it's tough to see that perhaps things could have been gone completely different thing, could have gone completely different, and this situation could have been avoided. And Madam Chair, that is why for this minister, 
there are two things that I really still miss. And I'm sure one is a very clear explanation as to why these documents indeed were missed. I am hoping there is a logical explanation to that to the minister, that there is some sort of statement why this is an issue. But secondly, Madam Chair, the first questions I pose to the minister is, what do you think could have done, you could have done better? What do you think we can improve upon? And we all know there can be improvements. And yes, it's okay to answer the question and say that in words. But Madam Chair, what I miss from this minister is contrition. I do miss that. And I, as somebody that has continued to have faith in you, and wants to continue to have faith in you through you, Madam Chair, needs to see that, and I'm in the position to tell you, Minister, by you, Madam Chair, that that is being missed. The members of parliament, the public, and others need that from you. They need that from Jurendi Duran. Madam Chair, all kind of assumptions are being made about how Rolando Bryson is going to react or vote. I can tell you right now, nobody in this parliament knows how I would vote for such a motion right now until I receive the answer and the assurances I need from the minister. Because as we see right here, all of this could have been avoided. Maybe the documents did go and it was missed. Maybe the minister wasn't aware of the documents. I don't know. But there needs to be a good explanation for this, Madam Chair. Because unfortunately, and shame on the Daily Herald for not doing their proper due diligence before going and accusing companies of this type of thing as well. But could all of this have been avoided? Madam Chair, the minister is going to need some time to answer the questions. And whether anybody likes that or not, that is a fact. But the time, whatever that is, if it's a couple of days or a week or whatever, in that meantime, I'm going to remain conflicted on that. Because I do not understand how it's possible that these things are not being done completely. Madam Chair, the minister will need to return to parliament, and I want contrition. Minister Duran. You, need, you have a lot on your shoulders, I get it. I've been there. I understand the attacks and all of this. But if there's one lesson I learned, is that sometimes you gotta sit back and tell yourself, you know what? Let me really internalize how I can really be the best person I am. Because it's in you somewhere. But throughout this process, we're not seeing it yet. And that potential needs to be untapped for you to continue to have my support. You have two other members of parliament that have joined this coalition also to support you. And no eyes, eyes are not on the opposition, really, because everyone knows they alone cannot fire a minister. The eyes are on those people like me that have chosen to have faith in you. Please, minister, do not shatter that faith. Please, minister, show respect to all the members of parliament. Show respect to the ombudsman. I would like the minister to go back and sit with every single department head and say, listen guys, it's been two years and a half, we have a year left. How can we get things growing? How can we fix things? How can we improve? And come back with that level of contrition. That is what I need, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, in closing, I would like to thank the Ombudsman once again for the report. I do believe there are a lot of questions to go deeper into, like these different sheets and scoring and the procedures and what goes to the governor or not. But in 10 minutes' time, it's extremely difficult to do that. But I think the most important question that the minister needs to answer for his survival of a motion of no confidence is, are you ready to tell the people and to tell me that yes, there are truly some things that I could have improved upon sincerely and that I will do so. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Bryson. Next on the speakers list, we have MP Sarah Westcott Williams. You have the floor. Good evening, Madam Chair, lady, and thank you. Good evening to my colleagues. Good evening to the minister and his support staff. Madam Chair, lady, I can't say I don't know where to start. I do know where to start. And I want to start, Madam Chair Lady, with this 
debate and the minister's thrust with respect to this policy that he created, had to create, in fact, the minister in his policy and in parliament suggests that what he prepared and what he has, and I need a minister to be clear whether he has made this policy public or he has publicized it, published it. There's a difference. So has he made it public, just put it out there, or did he publicize, published it rather? But listen to this, Madam Chair Lady. The discussion, or my point on this matter, is the following. So this policy got a lot of, a lot of, I have to say fluff by the, by the minister. Because according to the minister, this was something that was sorely lacking. And in fact, the minister, as I said before, indicated that he, he hopes this, what he, public, what he made public, this policy on tender procurement, that that can serve for the, the rest of the government, I believe. Madam Chair, lady, listen to this in this very hyped up policy. And I just take from it, we received it in the documentation regarding the wastewater, et cetera, et cetera. We received the policy from the minister. And the minister says in this policy, the minister reserves the right to alter and or adjust, modify this policy and or issue an entirely different policy and or withdraw this policy if and or when such may become necessary. Any decision pertaining to this and or any other future policy within the Ministry of Romy is at the sole discretion of the Minister of Romy. So, Madam Chair Lady, today we have this policy. And don't be surprised if tomorrow morning a completely different <coughs> policy surfaces because that's what has been established in this policy. So does the minister understand the skepticism by the ombudsman as well as members of parliament where this, this, this hype of having, but we have a policy now regarding tender procurement. Madam Chair Lady, we had the start of this meeting a good, a good while ago. And then we had the opportunity, and we understood why we did this without the presence of the ombudsman, but we had the opportunity to look deeper at the report in question. Madam Chair, Lady, and it's during those discussions that I ask information more general regarding the matter of waste management on St. Martin the vision of the government on this. Um, I heard the minister enlisting, enlisting some of the accomplishments, which was one of the leading questions to the minister. And the minister highlighted many, many issues, many issues that are now, are now being executed by the NRPB. And proudly, proudly so the minister lists these projects as, you know, his, his, his accomplishments. And why do I now tie this into what I'm saying? Because the minister now in his capacity, ma capacity, Madam Chair Lady, is one when he was a member of parliament, was so very critical of, then, of the then government regarding, regarding the very money of the trust fund, Madam Chair Lady, that today is allowing the minister and his colleagues to boast of things that he and they have accomplished. Yeah, remarkable indeed, Madam Chair Lady. The, so I can, but I hope to get those answers regarding the whole NRPB and the, what the projects that have been carried out and the, 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 the minister's vision for waste management. I hope still to receive the answers to those questions. But Madam Chair Lady, it cannot go unnoticed that, and some have changed their tune, but not all, regarding the undermining of the office 
of a high council of state, in this case, the Ombudsman office. Madam Chair, lady, I stated it in the begin at the beginning of this meeting. If we are going to establish ourselves as one of the, and I used at the time, as a judge in the case of receiving reports from our high councils of state, judge in terms of the reports that we receive, and then the government and government ministers on the other side, then, then, then we might as well save the money, a good amount, that is paid to our high councils of state. Then we might as well save that money. Because if they are doing their work in terms of investigating and making report according to their, their own purview, then, Madam Chair, lady, we might, as well, we might as well save the money that we pay these high councils of state to do the work to assist parliament especially in doing its work. So, Madam Chair, lady, the now and then to add insult to injury, now that's not the right, the right word, that's not the right phrase. It's actually adding, um, making matters more complicated. Let me use that. Then we receive what was now used to put up on a screen here in Parliament, the evaluation sheets. We received the evaluation sheets, which at the time with the Ombudsman, were not made, could not be made public because um, based on the, 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 the law on openness, in, on openness in government. Now that we have these, now that we have these sheets, the question would be, can, can the members of parliament, can parliament receive the scoring sheets, even anonymized, so that we could get a, 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 a even bigger picture of what is taking place. Because if one listens to the minister here today, Madam Chair Lady, this report of the Ombudsman is the furthest thing from reality. The furthest thing from reality. That's, that's, that's the way the minister comes across in responding to questions asked, in responding to comments made. Madam Chair Lady, the, and I realize that we have very limited time um, continuing in this, second, in this second round. So, Madam Chair, Lady, that issue of the policy, the minister should agree that that was just something that was put out there, but actually has no, as I think my colleague, one of the colleagues before me stated, has no legal binding. Has no legal binding, absolutely. And that's why I asked the issue about pu um, made public or publicized. Why not put it since, I mean, it's totally out of the legal trajectory for such a policy, but why then at least give it some kind of ministerial responsibility? Madam Chair, Lady, I, I, that, that means I guess that I have two more minutes, so I continue. What does the minister think of the comments? What does the minister think of the comments uh, made regarding a company, which is mentioned in the report, like Leonard Enterprises. What, what is the minister's specific view on the comments regarding that company? Because again, when we see the evaluation sheets that we have been made privy to, the question is, so if those persons that had a DQ disqualified, what are, how does the minister view the comments regarding Leonard Enterprises, because in there, the, the, the ombudsman in her report says, given the history of that company, why not give them a chance to rectify what seemingly was, was, was I can't even say wrong, was not submitted um, in the way it was supposed to. Why not? It's the ombudsman mentioned this, Madam Chair Lady, not, not, not me. So I'm asking, what is the minister's view on that particular issue raised in the report by the ombudsman? Madam Chair, lady, this policy, I want to get back to the policy. Was the policy vetted by the Legal Affairs Department of Government? The, the policy that has been made public, was that vetted by the, by the Legal Affairs Department of Government? Madam Chair, lady, I had asked, I think I asked this when we dealt with the report in the, in the Central Committee, the legal affairs review of the TOR, now I'm talking the terms of reference, um, 
can that, apparently it was done, which I'm reading from the report, and can that be provided? Can, can the parliament be provided with that, with that, with that re review? Madam Chair, lady, um, as, a state, as was stated, we see where this, this meeting is, um, is probably going to be going. So, Madam Chair, lady, I, I don't think that this is, this is the end of this, um, not only of this meeting, definitely not of this meeting, but of this entire affair. And my question that I posed at the very beginning, um, the minister has not answered it in the way that I meant it. With the report of the, so I'm going to repeat that, Madam Chair, lady, with the report of the ombudsman that we have before us now, what are the potential consequences? Can anyone, can anyone in the view of the minister, he can't predict the future, I can understand that, but can anyone in the view of the minister um, get some, take some rights from the report that has totally discredited a process for the garbage collection contracts 2126 by the ombudsman, the High Council of State? Thank you, Madam Chair, lady. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Next on the speaker's list, we have MP Chanel Brownbill, but he is not in with us. So I will then move over to MP. We will now move over to MP Hyacinth Richardson. MP Richardson, you have the floor. Good evening, Madam Chair. Good evening to my colleagues. Good evening to the minister and his staff. Good evening to the good people of St. Martin. Madam Chair, you sit and you, it's on, it's on. you sit and you listen, and then you wonder with some MPs would be telling the members of parliament how many questions to ask and what should they be asking. What the audacity is this? Madam Chair, I have a few questions to ask, and I'm going to ask them because of the interest of time. I will post my question. I also want to say, not too long ago, I had an issue with one of the banks. And when people want to get at you, they do all kinds of things to, to try to harass you. My documents and my dossier was said to be missing. While I was early on the bank, everything was intact. An hour and a half later, they went missing. But guess what? They were in there, they were not missing, because we confirmed that. And who confirmed that? Another member of the bank sitting in that meeting took the documents from the manager and went through the dossier and bring every document that he said was missing in the same dossier and put them right there in front of us. Minister, maybe something like this happened to the documents that say that was missing. The documents were there. Anyhow, the opposition would argue, the opposition whole argument comes down to one thing. They are saying that Aviana was awarded parcel five illegally, and some form of bait rigging took place. Minister, with my question, I believe you can once and for all dispel this nonsense, Mr. Chairman. Madam Chairman, and I will ask the first question. What parcel was Aviano awarded? Second question, what parcel did they bid for? Third question, what parcel were they disqualified for? Fourth, for the parcel that they won, please provide the evaluation sheet. Five, does losing one parcel mean you cannot win in any other parcel? Six, what causes someone to be disqualified? from the bidding process. Seven, who has the final decision on someone being disqualified? Eight, where is, where is the above outline in the law? 
what policies and laws govern this quali disqualification. Nine, was the governor aware of the fact that all documents for Aviano for parcel five were submitted? Ten, can the minister provide a detailed account and timeline of the process surrounding the uh, awarding of process parcel five? Eleven, did the minister observe any strange behavior from committee members during that process? Can the minister provide detailed accounts of minutes of those conversation, if any? Twelve, is Aviano performing the clean up of parcel five adequately? Thirteen, what is the evaluation process of garbage companies after the start work? Fourteen, were there any civil or criminal cases ever tied to awardees or parcels in the previous tender, 2016, and which minister granted those tenders? Can the minister check with the courts and the prosecutor about and if any cases are ongoing? Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Richardson. Next on the speakers, last on the speakers list, we have MP Solange Duncan. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, lady. A good evening to you. Good evening to the SG. A good evening to my colleagues here in Parliament. A good evening to the minister and his support staff. And of course, a good evening to the good people of St. Martin tuned in. Madam Chair, my job tonight as an MP is to review the answers that the minister uh, gave uh, to us tonight, but to also look at everything that has been presented, especially over the last few months, reports, emails, uh, memos, and in my opinion, hold everything up against standards. And these standards are principles of good governance, uh, standards of ethical decision making. As a policy advisor, Madam Chair, I understand how difficult it is to come into a ministry and change the way things work, okay? Uh, it's funny that we don't often hear change management plans from ministers because you're coming in with a new idea and the staff have been doing things for umpteen years. It is, it is difficult, I acknowledge that. And especially new policies, there can be some resistance. However, over the last few months, Madam Chair, and in everything that has been presented, there's a number of discrepancies, but also some new information that was provided recently. Through you, Madam Chair, to the minister, because there was mention made of a rush with the tender and, of course, needing more time in general to improve the process. In the minister's memo, he mentions that the department head and SG has a lot of decision-making responsibility. Very early on, one member of the evaluation committee resigned and some distanced themselves. Through you, Madam Chair, again, I would like to know to the minister if he met with those members who distanced themselves to speak to them and to ask them their reasoning. And if those conclusions, if those discussions, at least a gist can be shared with Parliament for us to understand why these members distanced themselves and why um, they resigned or, or not. Why? Because there has been a number of, we can say, accusations levied against civil servants in the case of the garbage contracts. So I would also like to know, through you, Madam Chair, if any warning letters were issued to civil servants those that had any issues, because we talk or we hear about behavior that took place during meetings. So I would like to know if any disciplinary action was taken based on what was said in the, in the memo. The completeness forms that were presented to Parliament recently, Madam Chair, um, definitely paint a certain picture. 
The minister mentioned that he believes that the documents were altered. Um, however, some employees, including coalition employees, have talked about um, the validity of the documents, or at least the appearance of validity. And so I would like to ask the minister, through you, Madam Chair, if he is willing to ask the persons whose signatures appear on those completeness forms to present statements or declarations that the document had been signed by them or is the document or, or the documents are forged, so to say. So is the minister willing to ask these persons uh, to make declarations? That is it for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. MP Duncan, for your questions and remarks. Do you have any questions? No, just remarks. Yes, questions as well? Yes. MP Duncan is the final speaker for tonight in round two. I would like to now turn the floor over to the minister or maybe take a brief adjournment to discuss with the minister. Let's take a brief five-minute adjournment. I'll discuss with the minister how long he would need to answer the questions posed. Meeting adjourned for five minutes.
Welcome back, members of Parliament. We just took a brief adjournment to allow the Minister some time to inform us how long he would need to respond to the questions posed in the second round. I would like to now turn the floor over to Minister for his closing remarks. Minister? Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Um, based on some of the questions I will pose, they are basically outside of the scope of the Ministry of Romy. I would need to seek outside. So I think approximately 10 days to respond to the questions I will pose. Um, I would also like to make some closing remarks on some statements that were made. I want to address specifically the documents that were presented here on the screen and also those of, um, the P that were published by the PFP faction is, and state that all the, the hype surrounding um, missing bank statements, reappearing bank statements, and that ultimately based on what is being said, Aviana won. It is clear based on what was displayed here that Adriana did not even win the parcel that the bank statement was missing. So I'm glad and I hope that the Herald can correct that. <clears throat> also, Madam Chair Lady, um, I remain committed to resolving issues of the past, issue that I inherited as a new minister, and that is definitely my, um, at the forefront of my agenda, as well as my colleagues here next to me and those that are in the office that are following. And the last point that was brought forward by um, MP Peterson with respect to Beauty Crystal, Chinese, and a supposed secret meeting. I would like to say that that is a Chinese restaurant that I frequent a lot, and I love their hot wings. And me and some of my friends, including my brother, we, we hang out there a lot, as well as Andre on the front street, which have some very nice muscles. So if I frequent a Chinese restaurant, I don't know how the MP could tie that into any secret meeting. And people don't have secret meetings in Chinese restaurants. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Duran, for your closing remark. With that, members of Parliament, we have come to the closing of this meeting. I will then adjourn. Yes, I was just closing. Yes, I know. <laughs> I will then adjourn this meeting. I will then adjourn this meeting for 10 days as proposed by the Minister. Meeting adjourned for 10 days. <laughs>